Hi, I'm glad you're here. And here is the playground outside Zion Church building. It is a beautiful day, although it's a little bit cloudy. But this is a day that God made just for us to have together. We talked at one time about people who can't speak with their mouths, so they use their hands to make words. And today I would like to teach you a prayer that you can use your hands to pray. And it goes like this. Jesus, point to your hands. Jesus, you are awesome. Awesome means wonderful, super, big, great, all those good words. Jesus, you are awesome. The next part, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for loving me. The next part, Jesus, I'm sorry for doing bad things. Jesus, I'm sorry for doing bad things. And the last part, Jesus, help me do good things. Jesus, Help me do good things. So now when you pray, you can use your hands to talk to Jesus too. Let me pray for you, okay? Dear Jesus, I thank you for the boys and the girls and even the big people who are with them right now. Thank you for how very much you love them. Please help them to get to know you better. Teach them how to tell the difference between good things and bad things and to do the good things. Thank you for loving them no matter what. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This display case is in the north end of the narthex. It's a kind of legacy. Memories from when we were still in the North White Oak Street building. A legacy given to us to remember where we've come from. I wonder how many babies have been born during coronavirus. Can you just picture this scene? The phone rings. The voice on the other end says, Mom, Dad, it's a boy. Everybody's doing fine. But you can't come to see them. Oh, the frustration. But, Lord willing, one day, you'll be able to hold that very grandchild. In the meantime, we can connect by phone or video. And in time, thoughts of a legacy may come to mind. What can I pass down to this grandchild to remind him or her of us, of me? Something that may be helpful to them, beneficial to them for the future. Naomi is in the middle of that very kind of thinking as we're winding down the story of Ruth. Let's take a step outside, look at another piece of legacy, and we'll talk more about Naomi's legacy to her grandson. We are at the point in Naomi's story where her daughter-in-law, Ruth, has been essentially rescued from her poverty by a man named Boaz. And we pick up the story in chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. 
He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The Lord had provided so much for Naomi all through her life, and now in her old age, he provided something just as vital as all the things that she had experienced from him before. In her old age, she had a purpose, a reason to get up in the morning, a reason to continue day after day. She now had a grandson. The verse says, Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. That word cared for him means more than just feeding and changing and rocking him. It meant that she was a kind of guardian for him. She invested her life in him. She had an influence, a very strong influence in his life. I can just picture Grandma Naomi with little Obed as he was growing up telling him the stories of how terrible life had been at one time in Moab, where his mother was originally from. How the Lord had provided what they needed. And when they came back to Bethlehem, how the Lord brought his mom and dad together. And most importantly, just how much Naomi loved little Obed. Obed grew up to have an influence on his own grandson who would go on to become the greatest king Israel ever had, David. And David could trace his greatness back to Grandpa Obed, who in his turn could trace his influence back to Grandma Naomi. Legacy is not just about something you hand down Legacy is about your influence. And not just a family. In Psalm 71, David, as an older man, said, Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, Lord, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Naomi talked about God's wonderful provision, his might, to her grandson Obed. And the Bible says that we can do the same kind of thing when we exert our influence in the lives of the people the Lord brings into our lives. Exerting an influence. A group of retired friends who meet every Saturday morning at a Salt Lake City deli were getting tired of the same conversation every week. Sure, they were solving the world's problems, but they wanted to share their wisdom beyond their group of just seven. And so just for fun, they set up a card table at a nearby Salt Lake City farmer's market and told people that they were dispensing free advice. They even made a huge banner that read, Old Coots Giving Advice. It's probably bad advice, but it's free, the banner read. To their surprise, people started showing up and sharing their problems. A lot of people. They asked things like, where can I find somebody to love? Have I put in enough time on my job to take a week's vacation? How do I keep romance alive? These men also field questions about how to keep romance alive. I always tell people the first thing you do is put down your phone and start talking. Every Saturday, the old coots take on the issues that people present to them, and about 30 to 40 people come to stop and ask advice. One of the members of the group said, This is a way for a person to get an outside opinion from somebody who has nothing to gain. Somebody told us the other day we're the most popular attraction at the market. We always listen carefully and don't give gratuitous advice. 
Okay, maybe setting up an advice stand at a farmer's market is not your cup of tea. It would not be for most of us. But you still pass on a legacy every time you influence someone that the Lord brings into your life out of your relationship with the Lord Jesus. In Philippians 2, Paul says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Hold out the word of life. You are a light wherever you are, whoever you're with. Your influence is the way you hold out life. Sometimes in the way you talk. Sometimes in the way you serve people. Sometimes in the way you deal with your own suffering. You influence people. That influence in their lives is your legacy. It can mean all the difference between people thinking of us, now there is a real Christian, or thinking, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. You can certainly influence the people in your life, but you can be very intentional with just a few to talk to them regularly, to listen to them, to take them seriously without taking yourself too seriously. You can't do that with a lot of people. In Northwest India, there is a place that could be the wettest place on earth. It's a mile high mountain range with one year received a total rainfall of 82 feet. It's a battle just to stay dry. Most of the rain comes during the summer monsoons. And for people to be able to get around, the place is just crisscrossed with gorges and valleys. And there's no way to build a bridge across. The massive amount of water would just devastate any man-made bridge. And so the people of the area came up with an ingenious way to build a bridge. They planted what were called strangler trees. And as they grew, the roots began to grow out. And they would train the roots to go across the gorge. When they grew long enough to get all the way across, they would train those roots to grow into the opposite side of the gorge. They planted several of these trees, and when they got large enough and their roots were anchored in the opposite side, they would slather mud across the roots to make a smooth walkway. And that bridge became strong enough to actually carry human traffic. And no matter how bad the rains got, as long as those trees could stay anchored in either side of the gorge, the bridge would stay in place. You can imagine, this is not the kind of job you can do in a day or a year. This spanned generations. And so the people in the area would teach their children the dream of making a bridge and help them understand how to care for the trees. Your legacy not only to the people who come into your life, but even to individuals, just a few, in whom you invest yourself. It's one way to help you face the end of life and know that you can finish well. That can be difficult. Being able to finish well. The president of what is now the Columbia International University, named Robertson McQuilkin. A very prestigious position. 
a man with an incredible intellect, deeply, deeply devoted to the Lord. He resigned his post because his wife was showing signs of Alzheimer's. The speech that he gave upon his resignation shows a man willing to do what's necessary to follow his commitment to his wife, a man who finished well. I haven't in my life experienced easy decision-making on major decisions, but uh, one of the simplest and clearest decisions I've had to make is this one, because circumstances dictated it. Uh, Muriel, now, uh, in the last couple of months, seems to be almost happy when with me and almost never happy when not with me. In fact, she seems to feel trapped, becomes very fearful, sometimes almost terror. And when she can't get to me, there can be anger. She's in distress. But when I'm with her, she's happy and contented. And so I must be with her at all times. And you see, it's not only that I promised in sickness and in health till death do us part. And I'm a man of my word. But as I have said, I don't know with this group, but I've said publicly, it's the only fair thing she sacrificed for me for 40 years to make my life possible. So, if I cared for her for 40 years, I'd still be in debt. However, there's much more. It's not that I have to, it's that I get to. I love her very dearly, and you can tell it's not easy to talk about. She's a delight. It's a great honor to care for such a wonderful person. As we're thinking about our own legacy, the influence we want to have, I'd like to share with you a prayer found in the Bible of an old nun. Pray with me. Lord, you know better than I know myself that I am growing older and one day I will be old. Keep me from the fatal habit of thinking I must say something on every subject and on every occasion. Release me from the craving to straighten out everybody's affairs. Make me thoughtful but not moody, helpful but not bossy. With my vast store of wisdom, it seems a pity not to use it all, but you know, Lord, that I want a few friends at the end. Keep my mind free from the recital of endless details. Give me wings to get to the point. Seal my lips on my aches and pains. They are increasing, and the love of rehearsing them is becoming sweeter as the years go by. I dare not ask for grace enough to enjoy the tales of others' pains, but help me to endure them with patience. I dare not ask for improved memory, but for growing humility and a lessening cock sureness when my memory seems to clash with the memories of others. Teach me the glorious lesson that occasionally I may be mistaken. Keep me reasonably sweet. I do not want to be a saint. Some of them are so hard to live with. But a sour old person is one of the crowning works of the devil. Give me the ability to see good things in unexpected places and talent in unexpected people. And give me, Lord, the grace to tell them so. Amen. And amen.